How's it going, Pearlside? 26 years. I remember when I turned 26. That was a good year. It was a good year. Amen. Uh, it's great to see you all in the house. Thank you so much for being here, for joining us in one of our, at our in-person service here. Um, and today we're concluding our series, Stan. And um, by the way, you know, just, just to talk about that, you know, Pastor Norman and the team 26 years ago uh, felt called by God to come and plant this church out of the mother church in town because they felt God called them to come and reach people on this side of the island. And aren't you glad that he did? Amen. How about we give a hand to Pastor Norman and the team that planted Pearlside 26 years ago. Um, I'm going to move closer. I feel so far from you. Um, and, uh, you know, because if it wasn't for their step of faith, their decision to do something, many of us wouldn't be uh, in the kingdom of God right now. And so, you know, something happens when you obey the word of God and take a step of faith and take that risk to step out and do something. Amen. Um, good things can happen. And God wants to move in and through every one of our lives. He wants to move on the earth. But he often waits. In fact, he always waits for a person to step up and do something. God is sovereign, and he can do anything that he chooses on his own without us. But here's the thing. From the very beginning, the Bible tells us that God has chosen to work through human beings. He chose to work through Adam and Eve. That didn't go so well. He chose to work through Israel. That didn't always go so well. And then he chose to work through Jesus and the church, and things ought to be doing well because we were obeying him. Amen? But God waits for us to step up and do something to move in the earth. And that's what happened here at Pearlside. And that's what God wants to continue to happen through every single one of our lives where you and I go throughout our weeks and our days and our lives. That God would do something through us. So the title of my message this morning as we conclude our series is Do Something. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, do something. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that we are in Tier 2. Anybody else? Tier 2 Hawaii? Come on, I can. Yeah. <laughs> We can finally, you know, use that gym membership we paid all that money for. Uh, I can eat with people that are not in my household at a restaurant. And now we can get that tattoo we've been wanting to get, you know, so because tattoo parlors are open. Um, but, um, you know, God is constantly moving us forward and, and we never want to get stuck in a season and get trapped in place. The devil would want to keep every person stuck where they are, not progressing forward, not advancing the will of God and not advancing the kingdom of God. And so we have to celebrate these opportunities we have to move forward and, and do something. And we're going to take a look at a passage of scripture here where Israel, the nation of Israel, was locked down due to the Philistine army. The Philistines had entrenched the Israelites, basically kept them uh, moving from moving forward, kept them in captivity. But the problem was the Israelites were locked down with fear. They didn't feel like God was going to lead them, was going to protect them, was going to deliver them. And so they were hiding literally in caves and in holes Locked down in fear because of the Philistines that were advancing against them. But somebody rose up to do something. It was the son of the king. His name was Jonathan. And he was so frustrated with the fact that Israel had been, is, is being oppressed by the, Israel, uh, by the Philistines that he rose up to do something. One man decided to do something, and it affected the tide of that battle and, and history as a result. And so we're going to take a look here at um, 1 Samuel chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, it'll be up on screen for you. But 1 Samuel chapter 14 tells us this story, and we're going to extract spiritual principles for ourselves and how we can move forward in the midst of whatever challenges we are facing. 1 Samuel 14, starting in verse 6. Jonathan, the son of the king, said to his young armor bearer, come, let us go over to the outposts of those uncircumcised men, speaking of the Philistines. Perhaps, everyone say perhaps. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. Jonathan said, come on then, we will cross over toward them and let them see us. If they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and we will not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands." So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outposts. Look, the, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. The men at the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Let's pray this morning as we begin. Father, we thank you for your word that you, you've given to us to shine a light into our lives and into our circumstances, to show us your heart and a way to move forward a way to get unstuck and untrapped by the, by the enemy's schemes. And so, Lord, I pray that you would, with your spirit, by your Holy Spirit, illuminate our hearts so we may hear what you want to say this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, get, get this picture. <clears throat> the Philistines 
had encamped around Israel. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to destroy him. Everyone was afraid, including the king. And so it took a young man by the name of Jonathan, the king's son, to rise up and be frustrated enough to say enough is enough. Somebody's got to do something. If nobody else wants to rise up and do something, then I'm going to do something. And so he goes up all by himself with his armor bearer, two men, coming up against a Philistine outpost, which some would say is around 20 to 40 trained soldiers, right? How many of you know that's, that's not a smart idea, just in the natural, right? Um, that's not a strategic thing to do. And then they do something else that's crazy. They, they, they reveal themselves. Like, if you're going to attack 40 dudes, you want to do it, like, you know, secretly. You know what I'm saying? Like, just come in and, you know, when they're not looking. But instead, what they do is they reveal themselves. Like, hey, look, here we are, two of us against all of you. And then their test, right, was if they say come up to us, that means God has given them to, to our hands. If they basically they say, come, climb up this cliff and attack us, you two guys against us 40, that will be God's sign. My sign would be the exact opposite. If they say, we'll come down to you, leaving their strategic advantage to come attack you. Everything about this attack, this battle plan was dumb. It was foolish. It was foolhardy. But yet, God honored their faith and their decision to do something and it ended up, as you'll see in a little bit, turning the tide of the battle. Now, there are spiritual principles that God wants us to get out of this, which is why it's here in Scripture, right? Now, it doesn't mean like, you know, when, you, when you're upset at something, just go like attack people, okay? Uh, that, this was a very different time in history. That's not the principle God's trying to get. But there are spiritual principles that we want to take out of this to help us to move forward in this season. The first thing we see here in your notes is this. Don't tolerate what God wants to eliminate. Don't tolerate what God wants to eliminate. <clears throat> remember they were locked down no one was going to do anything the king the, the mightiest leader the, the, the soldiers they were all hidden in fear and Jonathan said someone's got to do something about this I'm not going to tolerate the oppression of the Philistines any longer I'm not going to tolerate them hindering us from living the will of God and moving forward in the purpose of God anymore somebody's got to do something and he looked around no one was willing to do anything so he said all right I guess it's got to be me then because if no one wants to stand up and make a difference then I guess I got to right? Don't tolerate what God wants to eliminate. First Samuel, back to the, the verse we read, Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, it wasn't even an older experienced warrior, just one dude, come, let's go over to the outpost of these uncircumcised men. Now, don't get the uncircumcised thing in your mind too much, but basically that was a dig at the Philistines. It was, it was like, these guys don't want to honor God. They resist the will of God, and it, there's frustration in his soul. And, you know, sometimes God uses frustration to move us from places of comfort and convenience to take steps of faith. Sometimes that frustration we feel is God actually trying to get us to change our circumstances where we've been complacent and comfortable, where God wants to move us forward. Now, let's be honest. Sometimes frustration is just our flesh and our, you know, our human sinfulness. But if it lingers and, it, and, and if it uh, coincides with the word of God, maybe it's God moving us out of comfort and convenience to a place of stepping into the will of God. But he, we can't tolerate what God wants to eliminate. And God doesn't want us to stay stuck. He doesn't want us to stay trapped in fear or hindered in moving forward in the will of God. And anything that would keep us from moving forward, we shouldn't tolerate. Can I hear an amen to that? Maybe right now, we're tolerating being stuck in life because of the external circumstances that we're, we're in, right? The, the coronavirus, the economy, we, we've been tolerating it for, for a while now. But maybe there's steps of faith God wants us to take in the midst of these circumstances and situations that would move us forward, but rather we're, we're, we're just waiting for things to happen. I shared with you guys last week that I was talking to a guy recently who was sharing with me all of these amazing ideas that he had and all of his goals for once the pandemic is over. And as he was sharing them with me, some of them, it's true, you can't do any of these things yet. You can't, you know, whatever. But some of them, I was like, dude, you can do some of this stuff now. What's stopping you from doing this now? And, and it was like a light bulb went off in his head. Like, that's right. Why am I waiting until all of this is over for me to begin living? And that's essentially what I said. I said, don't wait for this is over to start living for God. Some of this stuff you can do now. You can begin to do these things now. Why are you waiting? But see, what the enemy does is he gets us trapped in a, in a mode of thinking that says, when everything is peaceful and calm, then you can start living for God. When all of the obstacles and opposition and the problems go away, then you can start living for God. And the reality is, I think that that is a deception and a manipulation from the pit of hell to keep the church stuck. Can I hear an amen? To keep us trapped saying, when all of things are, are done, when the vaccine comes and schools open, and everything, then you can start living for God. 
but then here's where this goes. Once all of your problems go away and all of your finances are settled and your relationships are healthy, then you can start living for God. If we're waiting for all of our problems to be gone before we start living for God, we are never going to be living for God because we're never going to live in a world that's free of problems, opposition, and obstacles. Isn't that true? So we have to find a way to live for the Lord in the midst of the obstacles that we're facing. We have to find a way to obey God and be faithful to God. Obey the law, yes, but be faithful to God in the midst of the challenges that we face. But what I found in a lot of conversations with people, there's a mentality where we get trapped, and I feel it in myself too. Once everything is back to normal, then I'll live for God. Once all my problems are gone, then I'll take that step of faith. Are there steps of faith that God is calling us to take now? Are there steps of obedience that God is calling us to take now that will then help us to move forward in the midst of these challenges? Right. Maybe, you know, I was just talking to a guy in my small group this week whose you know, wife was unemployed, but God broke through, got her a job, a good job that she's really happy about. And they're, they're really happy about. And, you know, one of the things that they've been faithful to tithe the entire time, even when he almost lost his job, she lost her job. They're like, no, we're going to keep obeying God. And there's something about obedience that moves the hand of God because he tells us very clearly what he wants us to do in his word. And when we obey, when we take those steps of faith, God shows up. At the same time, I know of people who still haven't experienced the breakthrough of God. And, and, and I wonder, are there, step, are there steps of obedience that haven't yet been taken? Or is there disobedience that is lingering? And maybe you said, I'll start doing that once this changes. But maybe the step of faith and obedience in the midst of the challenge is what's going to unlock the breakthrough and unlock the hand of God. Because God's not going to bless disobedience. He doesn't. He's not going to bless sin. He doesn't do that. He blesses obedience and he blesses faith. What step of faith or, or, or what have you been tolerating that God wants to eliminate? Maybe it's the spirit of fear that's been keeping us trapped. One of the things we said in our online service this past week is maybe some of you, that step of faith is to start coming up, joining us in person, right? Because I know that there are a lot of people that are still so afraid to even leave their house because of the coronavirus. Well, maybe that is fear that needs to no longer be tolerated, and I need to take a step of faith out. And obviously, you're here, and you agree with that, so I'm preaching to the choir. But maybe for some of our friends and our family, we're stuck in, they're stuck in fear, and they need to take that step of faith, you know, because honestly, it's, I still feel safer here than I do at Sam's Club. Sam's Club is a jungle, bro. And, you know, if you're, you have enough faith to go there, you should have, have enough faith to be in the, the presence of God uh, with, with your, your friends and family who know how to wear your mask properly. Because, uh, uh, dude, some people at the grocery store, I just want to yell at them. Like, it's upside down, bro. You know what I'm saying? But anyway. <laughs> anyway is that anybody else's pet peeve? Like, it's upside down. Anyway. Sorry. But anyway, but, but, but maybe what we no longer need to tolerate is the fear that is keeping us trapped. What, what, what is it in your life that the enemy has kept you trapped in, has kept you stuck with, that maybe you no longer need to tolerate and step out? Maybe it's the spirit of, of, of selfishness, laziness, stagnancy. God wants to move us forward and we can no longer, we can't allow ourselves to stay stuck. That's what was going on. Jonathan observed, man, we have just been trapped here for weeks, not doing anything. Somebody's got to do something. So he rose up and he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out in faith and let's see what happens. Second thing that we see is as we step out and we need to step out in faith and trust God to do something through you. Step out in faith and trust God to do something through you, right? So what did he say? He said to his armor bearer, and I love this phrase, let's go up. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. I love this perhaps the Lord thing because there's a, there's a fallacy out there where we think that before I take a step of faith or before I do anything, I need to know with 100% certainty that this is what God wants me to do before I do anything, right? Now, if, if all of you know, there's very little things that you know with 100% certainty. Isn't that true? Like we almost never know with 100% certainty this is exactly what I'm supposed to do before we do it. And if we're waiting for absolute clarity, 100% certainty, then we're going to stay stuck and stagnant. And that's what I love about this phrase. He didn't know whether the Lord was going to deliver them. He didn't know if God was going to give them a victory. But he said, perhaps. And so let's step out and see what God does. See, a lot of times we wait for God to give us like some resounding voice from heaven. I've never heard the voice of God like that. I, I know some people who have and they're not crazy. So it happens, okay? But I, I've never heard the voice of God say, marry Naomi. You know what I'm saying? Have children, you know, or go to there, do this. I've never heard the voice of God. It's usually a sense, and then you take a step of faith in a perhaps God 
kind of a mentality, right? And as you take that step of faith, perhaps this is the will of the Lord, then something else happens, right? And you go, oh, perhaps that's the will of the Lord. Then you take that step. And then you go, oh, perhaps that's the will of the Lord. And you take that step. And then, and, and the Lord begins to illuminate your path as you take steps of faith. Some, the worst thing that we can do, and I wonder if this is what the Israelite army was doing. They were just hiding in their caves. God, destroy the Philistines. If you really want a victory, you would send fire down on them. And they stayed there for months and months and months and nothing happened. And Jonathan's like, perhaps the Lord wants us to go up there and kill them. You know what I'm saying? Perhaps the Lord wants us to do something about it. And as they took steps of faith, something happened. We get stuck when we're waiting for God to show us the whole plan. I was having a conversation with someone one time. He was like, why doesn't God just show me the whole plan of my life? Everything he wants me to do till I'm 100. I'll do it. I promise. I just need to know what he wants me to do. And I was like, that's a very good question. I used to think that too. Like, God, just show me exactly what you want me to do. I will do it. But then the Lord kind of revealed to me, if he gave us the roadmap of our lives, everything that we need to do from beginning to the end, we wouldn't need to seek him in prayer anymore. We wouldn't need to wrestle with choices and say, God, is this what you want me to do? And, and seek him in his word and seek him in solitude and seek him in prayer because I'll just pull out my roadmap. Oh, this is who you want me to marry? Oh, uh-huh. okay. You know? Oh, this is the job you want me to take? Okay. We wouldn't need to seek him and we wouldn't need a relationship with him anymore. I think the Lord withholds the roadmap and withholds clarity to force us to seek him, to force us to seek counsel from brothers and sisters. What do you think? To force us to walk with him every single step of the way. And here's what I found. Every time you take that step of faith, he shows us the next thing. Oh, I'm supposed to go there. And then he shows us the next thing, right? He doesn't show us the whole roadmap beforehand. He waits for us to take those steps of faith and then depend on him in that moment before he shows us the next thing. That's the way that the Lord works. And so Jonathan said, perhaps the Lord, I just get this sense we got to do something. Perhaps the Lord, when we, when we step out, will show us the next thing. And sure enough, he did. And sure enough, God gave him the victory, as we'll see in just a moment. But I wonder how many of us are waiting for God to paint the whole picture before we step out in faith. Can I encourage you? Don't wait for God to show you the whole picture. Follow that perhaps the Lord leaning. Step out in faith, and then God will show you the next step. Uh, Several years ago, uh, our church, we were praying about, you know, obviously we always pray about making a difference in our community. And we always used to, we always had a great uh, impact with athletes. Pastor Norman and, and Anthony Holyfield, as you know, were the chaplains of the University of Hawaii football team. By the way, it's great to have college football back, amen. It's great to see UH winning. Um, but, um, you know, and so they were the chaplains under June Jones. And it was just a great time of seeing, you know, young men come to faith in the Lord and the impact on the campus and in the community. And so we were praying several years ago because that had gone away after June Jones moved on. And we're praying, God, give us an open door to reaching athletes again. We feel like this is our, our call and what you want us to do. And so we're praying about that. And lo and behold, I get a phone call unsolicited from someone who said, hey, I got a football player at the University of Hawaii that, you know, who's brand new. He just moved here from the mainland. Uh, would you have lunch with him? And so I was like, well, that's weird. We're praying about it. And then I get, I don't get phone calls like that. You know what I'm saying? Like that was probably the first time in my whole life. Hey, you want to meet up with an athlete? Anyway, so can I be honest with you? I didn't want to. <laughs> I didn't want to because, listen. I got a lot on my plate already, and the last thing I need is to have to drive all the way to UH and meet with some kid that I don't know who probably maybe not want to meet with me. Who knows? Maybe it was, you know, some, you know. Anyway, so I was like, I don't really want to, but I was like, all right, I'll just step out and see what happens, right? So I stepped out. I showed up, and, and, and it was this guy by the name of Cole McDonald. You may remember his name. He was, the, he was the quarterback. But at the time, he was third string, brand new, red shirt transfer. No one knew who he was. And I'm like, I don't know who you are, so I had to look him up. I'm like, okay, whatever. So we just started having lunch. We just started doing the Purpose Driven Life together. Anyway, a few, uh, about a month later, he becomes a starting quarterback, starts breaking all of these records and winning all these, you know, collegiate awards. And, and that opened the door for me to help become the chaplain of the team, which I've been for the last couple of years, and just open doors into the, the football team and the community and all this stuff. And, but at the time, I didn't know what was going to happen. You know what I'm saying? For all I know, this is going to be a total waste of my time. For all I know, this kid's going to blow me off. Maybe he's not even going to show up because that's happened. Okay. Anyway, you're not the only one that gets blown off in meetings, by the way. I got stood up more times than I can count. It's just life. Anyway, so for all I know, nothing's going to come out of this. This is going to be a colossal waste of my time. But I took the step of faith, right? Perhaps the Lord is going to open a door. Perhaps something will come of this. And as I took those steps of faith, the Lord showed me the next steps and the next steps and the next steps and then opened doors to where we are now. And I wonder how many of us don't take that first step of faith because we can't see the whole picture. 
We don't take that step of faith because we don't say, what, what's going to come out of this? What good will come out of this moment? What good will come of me investing in this or, or taking that step to do that or giving to that or meeting with that person or starting that small group? Maybe it's going to be a colossal waste of time. But perhaps the Lord, and I wonder how many of us just need to take perhaps the Lord's steps of faith and see. Now, if I took that step of faith and nothing came of it, oh, well, what did I lose? I lost a couple hours of my life. Okay, well, we'll get that back somehow because I took a step of faith. But what would happen? Maybe the doors open up and we go, wow, I had no idea what God would do if I took that step of faith. Some of us are stuck because we haven't taken that step of faith. We've been waiting for God to show us the whole picture before we do anything. Perhaps the Lord may be the word you need to hear today. Take that step. Obey that prompting. And let's see what God does through it. As you guys all know, you know, Pearl Side, we've been trying to take perhaps the Lord's steps and making a difference in our community. And uh, last week I shared with you um, that we were able to give 100 laptops just this past week or two weeks ago to area schools. You know, that was a perhaps the Lord moment, right? We knew someone needed to do something. We're looking around. These kids don't have computers. Doesn't seem like anyone's doing anything about this. So like Jonathan, we said, let's do something and perhaps the Lord will show up. We didn't even know if we were going to be able to get the technology to give away. Um, but we, we were able to, you gave to it, and we were able to find it, and we were able to deliver it. And God is opening doors because of our perhaps the Lord's step of faith. I want you to take a look at this re short uh, recap video and uh, before we move on. So check this out. Here at Highlands are extremely thankful uh, for ProSide's church donation of 40 Chromebooks as well as headphones for our students to use. I would like to thank the congregation for um, the generous donation um, to the school and especially for our students. As a principal here, I'm very grateful for everything that you guys have done to support um, not only our school and students, but our families. This really means a lot because right now, currently in our community, in fact, all schools are struggling with equipment. Times are difficult right now. You know, I say that um, the students are not going to work on the academics if their social, emotional needs are not met. Um, we cannot do this kind of work without the community. So we are super grateful and um, we feel blessed. you know, um, your community. So thank you. And um, we appreciate everything you guys are doing, not only for us, but I know for other people. So no harm for everything. Proside Church, give God, give yourselves a hand for being a part of this and, and God. Um, I want to introduce this is Lena Samia and Jen Matias. Lena helped to coordinate and lead this, this, this Proside Cares initiative. Um, tell us, you know, what we're able to do and kind of what the next step is. So we were able to, as a church, take that step of faith, like Pastor Billy was saying, um, to give over 100 Chromebooks, 50 e-writers, 50 headsets with microphones, and 200 earphones to three different schools in our community, one elementary school, one intermediate, and one high school. And just to be able to be on the campus, build relationships with the administration, even as you saw, to pray for them, be on their campus praying, those are huge doors that were open. And now um, we get the opportunity, or there is an opportunity, other doors have opened to other schools within our area. And so we're working with different administrations um, on those campuses to see how we can fulfill the need and take that step of faith with them. It's awesome. We, like I said, we weren't even sure we were going to be able to find the technology to give away, but Lena did such a great job and we were able to fulfill all of that. And uh, now new doors are opening up. So praise God. And Jen, you were there as well. And Jen, Jen Matias is our kids' church director. If you don't know, they do a great job with our kids. But uh, you were able to be there, and you saw God open some doors. Tell us about that. Yeah, you know, so we really went in with that perhaps God will do something kind of attitude. We weren't sure what was going to happen. And so as we're dropping off the laptops and the Chromebooks and, and you know, the e-readers, um, the vice principal kind of pulled me aside and told me a story. He said he just got off the phone with a family because one of their elementary school children hadn't been in school for two weeks. 
And so he had to, of course, make that phone call. And he said the family had purchased a laptop in the beginning of the distance learning, but one of the kids stepped on it. So it wasn't working for two weeks. So two weeks, the kids weren't in school. And there was a high schooler, a middle schooler. And so, of course, whatever technology they had, the older kids were using it, but the youngest one wasn't able to. And we know that God's timing is perfect and impeccable. And he said, as soon as I got off the phone, he knew that we were coming. And he said, the Chromebooks that we were able to drop off is going to help this family. Because they were trying to save enough money, and they just weren't able to scrounge enough money to buy another laptop. It's expensive. But now they have a gift from, from you to them, to that family. And so we're really praying and hoping that every Chromebook, every technology, every electronic thing that we've offered would be an act of hope and a sign of hope for them so that they would eventually know our God that loves us so much. Amen. And you know, one of the things that I thought was just so powerful, you got to pray with all of them. And God was even moving in, in some of the people that we were praying for. And so, you know, I, I think we, when we take these steps of faith, we don't know where it's going to go. And we still don't know exactly how this is going to turn out, obviously. But we're taking steps of faith and we're seeing God open more doors. People that didn't really, we, we, we called all the schools, by the way. We're like, hey, you guys need help with laptops? Would you believe some didn't even call us back? We're going to give you guys free stuff. Hello. <laughs> Maybe they thought we were a joke. I don't know. Maybe they thought it was a scam. I don't know. But now they're all like, hey, um, so we actually want your help now, right? So doors are opening because we took that first step of faith, right? And that's how this works. God doesn't usually show us the whole shebang right off the bat. Usually we got to take a step, and then we see. So thank you for taking that step with us. Thank you, guys. How about a hand for Lena and Jen? Um, <clears throat> And there's so many people behind the scenes that worked on this. And many of you, I know, gave, uh, gave money to help make this possible. And we're going to continue to do that. But the reason why I share this at this moment is because it was a step of faith. Pastor Norman asked me after we did the blood bank and the food bank, what else does the community need? I, immediately, I was like, laptops. I know kids can't, can't do school right now. And that was a step of faith. And doors are beginning to open. And we're believing that doors are going to open into people's hearts. Doors are going to open in families to come and hear the gospel. Where'd you get this from? Oh, some church dropped it off. What church? Pearlside. Oh, my cousin goes to Pearlside. Open door, right? That's how this happens. But we have to start taking steps of faith in obedience in the direction of God and see what happens. And that's what Jonathan and his armor bearer did. They took the step of faith and then they, they, they began to move out. Uh, thir third point here we see is invite, invite others to do your something with you. Invite others to do your something with you. Jonathan ran it by his armor bearer. You know, I'm sure he prayed first, but then he ran it by his armor bearer. Hey, I have this idea, right? Let's go attack these guys. Now, if I was, if I was the armor bearer, I'd be like, no, I'm good. <laughs> you know, uh, Can we get like a bigger crew first, right? But something inside, he said, do all that you have in mind. Go ahead, I'm with you, heart and soul. And that brought confirmation to Jonathan that this is the will of God. A lot of times we're seeking the will of God by ourselves, and that's where we get tripped up. We're, we were meant to do this in community with other people where we run things by one another, which is why we have small groups, right? That in our small group, we, we process, you know, I feel like God is saying this to me about this situation. What do you guys think, right? God has given a spiritual covering and spiritual family to help do that, which is why we encourage everyone to be in a small group. Because I've, I've experienced this in my own life. When I try to figure things out by myself, I, I, I will convince myself one way or the other, which isn't always the will of God. I need outside mirrors and people to speak into my circumstance and situation. And that's what Jonathan did. He invited his armor bearer to be a part of this discernment process about the will of God. And then they stepped out in faith. Who is your, who is your armor bearer? Who are your armor bearers when you're processing the tough stuff of life? A lot of decisions are easy. They're black and white. And when scripture tells us black and white, you know, do not kill, do not steal, you know, be generous, all that stuff. But there's a lot of choices that we have to make on a daily basis that are not black and white, right? They're gray. What school should I send my kid to? Where should I live? Who should I marry? You know what I'm saying? Those types of decisions. What type of job should I take? Should I take that position or should I not? Those are all gray. The Bible's not going to tell you. It'll give you guidance and principles, but we, it's, it's, it's really a gray area. And as we process it with safe people, invite others to be a part of that process, a lot of times things get more and more clear. So if you're not yet part of a small group, I, I implore you to get connected. Because maybe the reason why we're, we get stuck is because we're not processing these decisions and choices with people who can really give us godly counsel and godly wisdom. If Jonathan was just by himself, maybe he would have talked himself out of it. Oh, man, I don't know. They got the high ground. There's like 40 dudes up there. Nah, I'm not going to do it. Right? But he processed it, and confirmation came. And the fourth thing, as we get ready to close, God honors acts of faith 
that sometimes defy the facts. God honors acts of faith that sometimes defy the facts. This is the crazy part to me, right? He said, if they see us, if they say to us, wait here until we come down to you, we'll stay here and not go up to them. It must mean God's not in it, right? But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. To me, the sign would have been the opposite. If they come down to you, giving up their strategic advantage and they come down, now I have the strategic advantage. To me, that would be the sign. His sign was they're going to stay where they are, keeping their strategic advantage. Ah, that's crazy, but it defied the facts. But something in his soul knew that that was going to be the sign that God was going to give him. God's will is not always going to be the easy way. It's not always going to be the logical way. It's not always going to be the simple way. It usually will involve risk at some level. But when we have processed it, we've prayed, we've processed with other people, we feel like it's the will of the Lord, we need to step out in faith and see what happens. And that's the point is that steps of faith need to be taken. A lot of times we wait for God to make it easy and simple and clear and obvious for us to take a step of faith. Isn't that true? But here's the thing. If it's easy, if it's simple, if it's obvious, is it really a step of faith? Or is it a step of easy, simple, obvious, right? It's easy, it's simple, it's obvious. Of course I would do that. It's not a step of faith anymore. And Hebrews tells us that it's faith that pleases God. It's when we step out where we can't see. It's when we step out where it's not easy and it's not obvious. But we steeped it in prayer. We got confirmation and we're doing it in, with the right heart. We're stepping out in faith. Oh, maybe that is the will of God and it pleases God because it's not easy, simple, and obvious. Maybe some of us are stuck because the only steps of faith we take are the easy, simple, obvious steps, which really aren't steps of faith at all. Maybe the step of faith God wants us to take is the scary one, is the one that doesn't make sense is the one that has the most opposition, is the one that defies my comfort and my logic. Maybe that's a step of faith that God is waiting for us to take. And then the result was this in verse 12. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and his feet. They're climbing up this cliff to fight these dudes. With his armor bearer right behind him, the Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer, and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. Then panic struck the whole army. Those in the camp and in the field and those in the outposts and the raiding parties and the ground shook. And look at this last part. It was a panic sent by God. It didn't make logical sense. In the natural, you're outnumbered. You're outgunned. You don't have the strategic advantage. But because they took a step of faith, a panic was sent by God. God moved. God showed up. And isn't that the point? That in our weakness, he is strong. In my failures, he is the one that brings the victory. It was a panic sent by God. If we wait for everything to be easy, obvious, it makes sense, we don't need God. I always say this, if it was easy, then we wouldn't need God. And God wouldn't get the glory. You would get the glory for making the easy, obvious step. But when we take a step of faith, God has to show up. And when he does, he gets the glory. All it takes sometimes is one person to stand up and to bring change. Um, I was always moved by the, by the story of Rosa Parks, and all of you ought to know her name. In December 1st of 1955, Rosa Parks refused to heed the bus driver's request to give up her seat to a white passenger. As we know, in the South, in, in, in Alabama, and all across the United States, unfortunately, segregation and racism was, was, was a massive thing. And so Rosa Parks made a decision, I am not going to tolerate this anymore. I'm not going to put up with this unjust treatment and she took a step of faith. Now, I don't think she thought she was starting a movement <laughs> by that decision, but she did. And thankfully, our country was transformed as a result. But look at what she said. I, I love this quote from her. She said, I instantly felt God gave me the strength to endure whatever would happen next, recounting that moment. She, she recounted, God's peace flooded my soul and my fear melted away. All people were equal in the eyes of God, and I was going to live like a free person. She wasn't going to tolerate what God wanted to eliminate. Amen? And she decided, I'm not going to go along with this anymore. She took a step of faith. And this is her exact words. And I quote, it was time for someone to stand up or, in my case, sit down. I refused to move. And as a result, a movement swept across our country of civil disobedience that changed the world, Right? But I don't think she thought in that moment, I'm going to start a movement. That wasn't in her mentality. It was just, I'm going to do something. Somebody has to do something, and I'm going to do something. And thank God that she did, right? 
But what about in all of our lives? Maybe the, something that we're going to do isn't going to, you know, change the world like that. But maybe it'll just impact somebody's life. Maybe it'll bring hope to a family or hope to someone who's on the brink of committing suicide or, or a marriage that's on the brink of divorce. Maybe you doing something can bring hope and change into a family's life, a child's life, an individual's life. Maybe that step of faith is in your workplace and you're going to bring peace and, and reconciliation in your workplace or the gospel to your boss or your coworkers. I don't know what that is. But as I said last week, we don't know what God will do when we step out. But here's what we do know. If we do nothing, then nothing will be done through us. And every single one of us have opportunities to stand up, to take steps of faith, to do something. And we have no idea what, that, what will come of that. But all I know is someone's got to do something. Amen. It's one of the reasons why I, I got into ministry. People always ask me that question. It's because I was looking around and, there was, and no one was doing anything about, about, about making a difference on, on the high school campuses or, or with middle schoolers or with college students. And so we got involved and I just started getting involved. And I had no idea that that would lead to where I am today. All I knew was when I was in high school, someone's got to do something with middle school students. Someone's got to do something on my high school. And things kept on going the way that they do. What something is God putting on your heart to do? What are you just frustrated with? And someone's got to rise up and do something about this in the name of Jesus. Now, obviously, we have a lot of frustrations that aren't Jesus related, but what stuff that aligns with the word is God calling you to step out in faith and do? I shared with you last week, and I'll close with this, um, about, about a guy in our church who felt the Lord call him to reach his coworkers and, and at, at his workplace. And so he did. He started reaching out, and his boss now goes to our church. She's a, she's a leader, and uh, he started a small group with his coworkers. And then he felt the Lord tell him, you know, I want you to move to another department because there's people there that I want you to reach. It defied logic. Like I said last time, it, it would make sense to me to stay right where you are. Your boss is saved. You're going to get a favor from your boss. Your coworkers are Christians. You'll probably have a better work environment. But he said, no, I feel like God wants me to move departments to reach people in another department. So he put in his transfer. And just this past week, he, he, he got the transfer to, to move. Why? So I can reach people there. Somebody's got to do something about these people not knowing about Jesus. I'm going to do something. And he's doing something, and something is happening through him. A friend of mine in my small group, you know, was just thinking, he just got saved last year. He said, man, someone's got to do something about my unsaved friends. Who's going to reach out to them? And he said, perhaps, God, if I invite them to start a small group on Zoom, maybe God will do something. And so he did. And now not only are his friends coming closer to the Lord on Zoom, they do an online small group, but their wives started a small group now. And they're starting to encourage one another about their faith as well. And he's saying, man, people, their, their marriages are getting healthier. Their relationships are getting better. It's amazing. But he just said, perhaps God. He didn't know what would come of it. And we still don't know, but he did something. And now God is doing something as a result. Amen. It can't just be a few of us. It's got to be all of us that say, God, like Jonathan, I'm going to take a step of faith, God. Perhaps you'll show up. I'm encouraged because if every single one of us just in this room, not counting the thousands that watch us online and at our other campuses, say we're going to do something, I believe things can change in the state of Hawaii, don't you? I believe things can change in the country if every Christian begins to take those steps of faith. But here's what I also know. If we do nothing, nothing will be done through us. And God is up in heaven going, do something. Step out in faith. I gave you the Holy Spirit. I gave you my son. Now what are you going to do with that? We're in a very hotly contested election season. Isn't that true? Very divided country. And we got to do something. We got to vote. We got to exercise that right to vote. And you know what? Even that's a step of faith. Isn't that true? But we got to do something. We can't just sit back and say, well, you know, Hawaii doesn't matter anyway. No, we need to exercise that right. And, you know, just on an aside before we close, you know, a lot of people get stuck because they, they're saying, well, I can't vote for either candidate because neither one of them perfectly represents Jesus or perfectly represents the Bible. I, I agree 100 percent. Here's the problem with that line of thinking. If we're expecting the person that we vote for to perfectly represent Jesus and perfectly represent the Bible, then you might as well give up your right to vote because there's never going to be a man or a woman that perfectly represents Jesus because only Jesus is perfect. Amen. But here's what we got to do. We have to study the issues. Don't just believe what the media tells you. We have to study the issues and, and study the word and find out, okay, God, what and prayerfully, what do you what, what are your convictions that you want me to have on these issues and then vote prayerfully vote in, in intelligently, not just based off of personality or because LeBron James said so or whatever. We got to do, we got to do the work, but then we have to step out in faith. Every one of the, every politician that you vote for is a step of faith, right? Oh my God, I have no idea what this person is going to do, but uh, God, I feel like this is what you want me to do. And then we can stand before the Lord saying, I took that step of faith 
with a clean conscience before God, right? That's what we have to do. It, 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 unfortunately, it's never going to be a perfect situation. And this year is obviously not a perfect situation. But whether we like it or not, one of these men is going to become the president. And so we have to do the work to take those steps of faith. Are you guys following what I'm saying? But if we wait for everything to be perfect and everything to be clear, then we'll never do anything in life ever. We can't live like that. God wants us to move forward, but move forward responsibly. Can I hear an amen?